Hello, Ira. Hello there. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, good. Good. Any problems getting on? Nope. Not good. at all. Very good. Anybody else uh, joining us yet? Uh, and panelists, not yet, no. Okay. I believe somebody tried to raise their hand, uh, an attendee. What? Oh, stop that. <laughs> no questions. Oh, we do have a, the Q&A function that we'll be uh, monitoring. So okay. uh, everyone else will be staying muted throughout this. We should probably uh, save the questions rather than have them, uh, uh, rather than answering them as they're asked, especially since we don't have a whole lot of time. Okay. It, it usually works a little better saving them, you know, and uh, especially since we don't have a break planned per se, uh, maybe about an hour in. All right, so maybe we'll stop after about the one hour mark, take some questions at that point. And, yeah. All right. Okay. Did, you, did you just stop sharing your screen? Is that what happened? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to see. Okay, it looks like Helen is uh, logged in. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hi, <laughs> Hi, Ira. Slight panic. Things were not going according to plan, but I didn't purposefully uh, block my picture, but. Well, I think we'll have the PowerPoint presentation up for, at least that's my intention, have that up for most of the right. so. Okay. All right. And I have the Wi-Fi password if things go awry in here. Checking in on the chat. Yes. Yeah. I'm hoping uh, you see this. The slideshow now? Yes. Good. I'm going to get a sweater. It's cold in here. Bonnie, we decided to uh, about an hour, at, at about the one hour point to uh, take questions. Okay, so not in between, just at the break time. Yeah. Are we doing chats? Um, I would say use people for questions. Use the Q and A function. Okay. 
I mean, there's a chat and the Q&A. I mean, we could try to monitor both, but I'll just encourage people to just use the Q&A function so we know where to look. Sounds good. Yeah. I know we did that last time, so I was curious if we would do it this time. That's good. Yeah, and, and taking questions while we're going is just going to send us down rabbit holes and we'll never get to the end. Well, Max, how are you? I'm well, Ira. Thanks for asking. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Max? Hi, Adam. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing well as well. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, all the panelists are here. We have 62, 63 participants logged in. Wow. Uh, we actually were over 90 last I checked in terms of registered users. So we can get going anytime or we could wait another minute or two. No, another minute isn't gonna hurt. Okay. There's a low flying plane near me. I have things rattling in my house. I hope no one hears it. <laughs> I was just turning around to see what I have in my background in my office. <laughs> I blurred mine out. I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Thankfully. Okay. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a picture of river rocks back there. I tell everybody it's an MRI of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Very colorful. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got 702, so I could get started with my spiel if we'd like. Yep. All right. I'm hoping everyone can see the uh, first slide of the uh, PowerPoint presentation, and uh, we'll jump right in. So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to session two of the certification courses, overview of the boards. My name is Adam Carson. I am an associate planner with the Rockland County Planning Department and also the executive director of the Rockland Municipal Planning Federation, the organization sponsoring tonight's webinar. Also with us tonight from the County Planning Department is Helen Kenny Burroughs, principal planner and deputy commissioner. The Rockland Municipal Planning Federation is a nonprofit organization that was formed 33 years ago, and actually to this day. Uh, so happy birthday to the planning department, or to the planning federation. Mm -hmm. One of the primary functions of the planning federation is to provide up-to-date educational sessions on relevant topics for planning board and zoning board of appeals members so that they can make more informed decisions regarding development applications. As many of you know, there is a New York state mandate for land use board members to complete four hours of training each year. All training sessions offered by the Federation can be applied towards this requirement, but tonight's session is also part of the Rockland County Certification Program, which was created in the mid-1990s through agreements between Rockland municipalities and the county. The certification courses were developed to educate board members on proper procedures, principles and practices of land use regulations, and the legal and regulatory framework of land use and zoning. There are three certification courses and every planning board and zoning board of appeals member is required to take the series once and then retake session two, the update of case law every two years. Dates have not been set for the sessions two and three, but will hopefully be announced soon. So watch your email. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. My email address is on the screen now. If you are on a board outside of Rockland County and need a certificate of attendance, please email or request to me with your name, municipality, and board. Board members within Rockland County do not need a certificate as the Federation maintains attendance records. Next, everyone is muted except our panelists and will remain so. If you have a question, please use the question function, which you can probably find at either the top or bottom of your screen. We will take a break at about the one hour mark uh, to answer questions at that time, and then we will continue with the rest of the presentation uh, and ask and answer questions again when we get to the end. 
Uh, please remember that your questions should focus on general issues and not be a project specific question. I would now like to introduce our three presenters, attorney Ira Emanuel and planners Bonnie Franson and Max Stock. Ira Emanuel is an attorney with 40 years of experience in real property, land use law, estates and trusts, and mediation. He is a graduate of the University of Rochester and Albany Law School and holds a certificate in mediation from Harvard Law School. He has a private law practice in New City, which concentrates on land use and land development issues. He has helped draft the zoning codes and comprehensive plans for the villages of Montebello and Slotesburg. He has represented projects such as the Watchtower World Headquarters, Audiovisual Studio, Live Work Facility in Aramapo, the Orange Avenue Transit Oriented Development in Suffern, known as the Sheldon, Pavian Homes and TZ Vista Developments in Nyack, the Minnesiango Park Mixed Use Development in Rambo, Ramapo and Haverstraw, and the redevelopment of the Nanuet Mall into the shops of Nanuet. Mr. Emanuel has provided legal counsel to boards and legislatures for Montebello, Suffern, Stony Point, Slotesburg, and Rockland County, and has served as a Suffern Planning Board member. He has lectured often on land use issues, including teaching tonight's session 20 times for the Federation. Mr. Emanuel is a board member of the Federation. He has helped prepare the current certification requirements, has drafted model resolutions and local laws, and shared the Federation's A Year of Transportation, a year-long series of panel discussions which examine transportation issues affecting Rockland County. He is a member of the Rockland County, New York State, and American Bar Associations, and he is chairman of the Zoning Committee of the Rockland County Bar Association. Bonnie Franson is a professional and licensed planner with over 30 years of experience in comprehensive planning and zoning preparation, site plan, subdivision, and CEQA review. She graduated from Bucknell University cum laude with a bachelor's degree in biology and from Rutgers University with a master's degree in city and regional planning. She completed a graduate certificate in geographic information systems from Penn State. She was named 2019 Women in Real Estate Building Services Leader by the New York State Real Estate Journal. Ms. Franton is a partner with Nelson Pope and Voorhees an environmental and planning consulting firm. She co-leads the firm's Airmont office. She has been involved in public and private land use and development projects throughout the Hudson River Valley and Long Island, the Long Island region. She is presently the municipal planner to the village of Tuxedo Park in the towns of Tuxedo, Montgomery, Blooming Grove in Orange County, Schwangunk and Hurley in Ulster County and Hyde Park in Dutchess County. She assists the town of Oyster Bay in site plan and CEQA reviews. She has completed five Brownfield Opportunity Program studies for the towns of Oyster Bay, Riverhead, and Southampton. She recently completed comprehensive plans or zoning updates for the village of Hilburn and the towns of Tuxedo, Schwangunk, and Poughkeepsie, and is presently managing a comprehensive plan zoning and zoning update for the town of Carmel. She completed a form-based code for the Pinewoods area of Hyde Park. She was recently retained to represent the Suffern Planning Board. In addition to lecturing on land use issues, Ms. Franson has written for the Talk of the Towns, published by the Association of Towns in the state of New York. She is a licensed planner in the state of New Jersey, a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners, and holds an advanced certif certification in environmental planning and a certificate from the National Charette Institute. And she is the planning board chairwoman for the town of Monroe. And lastly, Max Stock is a professional planner with over 20 years of experience in comprehensive planning, zoning preparation, site plan, subdivision, and CEQA review. Mr. Stock is also a partner at Nelson Pope and Voorhees working out of their Suffern office and is also AICP certified. He is presently providing planning services to the towns of Mamakating, Monroe and Stony Point, the villages of Monroe, Haverstraw, and the city of Glen Cove. He recently managed the preparation of comprehensive plans and zoning amendments for the town of Montgomery and the village of Haverstraw, and is currently working with both communities on implementing zoning updates. He also recently completed work on plans for the town of Mamakating and the city of Kingston. Mr. Stock also was retained by private and institutional applicants to prepare environmental impact statements and to assist with the development review process. 
He recently oversaw preparations of an EIS for a 68 lot subdivision application in the town of Goshen and is currently assisting with the application of a downtown boutique hotel and restaurant in the village of Highland Falls. Mr. Stock has lectured on land use issues and CEQRA as part of a continuing education series for certified planners, architects, and professional engineers. Most recently, he lectured on state environmental quality review at the New York Planning Federation annual conference. So given those very long and extensive resumes, I think we are very grateful to have such uh, experienced presenters here. Um, but before we get started, just uh, you've heard a little bit about our presenters, so I think we'd like to hear a little bit from you. I'm going to launch a poll just to get a sense as to who is attending. If people could just pick uh, what one answer best uh, describes them. Okay, a lot of people jumping in. Thank you. Give it another second. All right, so we have 86% participating. Uh, maybe uh, everyone else can't quite uh, reach the screen right now. So I will end the poll so we can share the results. So I'm hoping you can see that. Uh, looks like we don't have any legislators here tonight, but 48% uh, are planning board members, 27% ZBA members, and 3% other municipal commission members, uh, and a little bit of staff, and a little bit of members of the public. So. So. I believe uh, that's all I have. Um, Ira, I think you wanted to start off with a, another poll. If you'd like me to launch that. Uh, if you just go to the next screen, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there we go. Okay. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do the poll, poll in just a little bit. All right. All right. Uh, but first of all, uh, th thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we're, I see we're up to 77 participants. Um, uh, the uh, results of the, uh, the Who Are You poll uh, are always interesting. Uh, hopefully uh, those of you who are uh, land use board members uh, will go back and uh, help to educate your uh, village board and town board members uh, who weren't here this evening. Uh, we've got a lot of information to cover. Uh, this is uh, a somewhat abbreviated version of uh, what we would be doing if we were uh, doing it in person. Uh, normally, this would be a three-hour course, but uh, we, we do have some pity on you. Uh, so we're going to take this down to two hours, and some things will frankly be omitted. Uh, but uh, you'll be able to pick them up in session three. So uh, the first uh, thing that we want to talk about uh, is, you know, who gets to be uh, a member of a land use board? Um, all of you who are members of land use boards know that you were appointed by uh, your village board or your town board. Uh, you're, you're, you live in the community, you're at least 18 years of age, um, and you have to take an oath of office uh, to faithfully execute your duties in, in accord with the Constitution of the U.S. and the, uh, the state of New York. Uh, next, please. Okay. Uh, there are two basic boards that we're going to deal with here, and uh, we don't mean to slight anybody else, but the, the, the big two are the ZBA and the planning board. Uh, under New York State law, if you have a zoning code, then you must have a zoning board of appeals. And that's because the legislature figured out that no matter how good uh, Bonnie and Max are when they draft zoning codes, uh, they can't think of every uh, possible uh, consideration. And therefore, there are situations where variant exceptions, which we refer to as variances, are appropriate. Um, when you get into session three, you'll get into more detail as to what constitutes appropriate. Uh, but there are two basic types of variances. There is a use variance, which allows somebody to use their property in a way that the zoning code ordinarily wouldn't allow. And then there are area variances, which go to the dimensional requirements. 
Uh, the standards for use variances are much, much tougher than the standards for an area variance. Uh, for use variance, there is a checklist uh, of the types of, there's a checklist of, of, uh, of criteria. Uh, if you meet all of them, then you can get uh, your, your use variance. If you miss any one of them, then you may not get your use variance. Uh, with an area variance, on the other hand, the dimensional variance, uh, it's a balancing test. Uh, it's a, it's a, a determination that the board has to make as to whether the uh, benefit that is sought by the applicant uh, is, uh, outweighs or, or, or balances against uh, the impact of the, on the community of the variance. And there are five criteria that the ZBA has to uh, consider. Uh, an applicant for an area variance does not have to meet every single one of those criteria. Again, it's a balancing test. It's not a checklist. Planning boards, on the other hand, are not required under New York state law. Uh, there are a number of communities, especially upstate, uh, that while they retain subdivision authority and site plan authority to a planning board, uh, they do not, uh, site plan authority and subdivision authority to, to control uh, and approve uh, those, uh, those functions. They do not have planning boards and they, uh, they often re reserve that power uh, to the uh, local legislative body, the, uh, the town board or the village board, or in some cases, the, uh, uh, the, uh, city, um, the city council. Uh, a planning board uh, uh, deals generally, as I said, with site plans and subdivisions. Sometimes they get special permit, get involved with special permits. Uh, ZBAs sometimes get involved in special permits. That's a matter of local consideration. A planning board, unless it is specifically authorized, cannot vary or waive provisions of the local zoning code. Some communities, particularly those uh, in the uh, in in in, uh, uh, in Ramapo and, and the uh, Ramapo villages, uh, will have provisions that will allow the planning board to grant some uh, waivers of a limited kind uh, for things such as the number of parking spaces that are required. But that power is specifically granted in the zoning code. Uh, without that specific authority, uh, an applicant would have to go to the ZBA in order to get a variance. Planning boards, I like to talk about, uh, when, when I talk about them, I like to say that it's, it's a negotiation process that's carried out in the public. The applicant comes in with an idea for using his or her property, uh, meets with the planning board, uh, the planning board may uh, may question some uh, some of the things that the applicant is trying to do, may push back harder with respect to some other things. And then, of course, when you get to a public hearing and the, uh, the public uh, uh, has its uh, com opportunity to comment, there may be additional changes that are made. Uh, the whole idea is that through this uh, um, public negotiation, if you will, these various iterations, uh, that the project is improved uh, and uh, you come out with something that is better than what you started out with. And of course, there are times when, when uh, projects are disapproved. Uh, and uh, if that is the appropriate thing for the planning board to do, then the planning board should do that. Okay, next Adam, please. Okay. Uh, as, as, um, I indicated before, like as, as zoning boards are created by uh, state law, so are planning boards, um, but the planning boards are an, a local option. Uh, you can see uh, and you can see the uh, types of things that a planning board will do and, and typically handle. Uh, there are training and attendance requirements. Uh, all of you who are here are fulfilling some of your training requirements. And obviously, if you're going to be a member of a planning board, uh, you should be attending as many of the meetings as you possibly can. Obviously, uh, uh, you, you have excuses for illness and occasionally people may have vacation time that interferes. Uh, but if you don't have uh, the ability to attend most of the meetings, then you really should not be on the planning board. A few years ago, the state legislature granted the uh, local, local communities the ability uh, to appoint alternates and that again is a local option. Um, most of the time the alternates are seated because there is an illness uh, of one of the permanent members or because one of the permanent members has an irreconcilable conflict uh, that would prevent him or her from participating. Next, please. 
ZBA, similar situation with respect to training and attendance requirements. Uh, again, as I said, the ZBA is uh, created uh, by the uh, state statute. Uh, it is required if you have a zoning code. Uh, but in addition to the area variances and the use variances and the special permits that we talked about before, the ZBA can also hear appeals from uh, administrative decisions made by the enforcement official. Uh, typically, that is the building inspector or the code enforcement officer. Um, and, and that is a different type of situation than you would have with an area variance or a use variance or even a special use permit. Uh, with the variances and the special use permits, you have a rubric that is built into the zoning code. Uh, with an appeal, you have to take a look and see what the code says, what it means, uh, how it's been interpreted in the past. Uh, you will sometimes be guided uh, by, uh, by legal requirements, legal precedent in similar situations. Uh, and you're really sitting very much uh, more as a court in that situation uh, than even with the uh, the variance or the, or the special use permit. Uh, the training and attendance and the ultimate requirements are similar to planning boards uh, along with the alternates. Adam? Okay. The land use boards, the planning board, and the zoning board are not operating in a vacuum. Uh, those of you who have spent some time with those boards uh, either as a member of the board or as a member of the public that is uh, um, attending one of the board meetings, uh, you've become aware of this. Uh, the, uh, both of the boards, and, and to a certain extent, more the planning board than the ZBA around here, uh, you, you have to interact with your building inspector or your code enforcement officer. Uh, ZBAs uh, do that especially when they're uh, taking appeals from the building inspector or the CEO. Uh, very often you'll have a relationship with the village or the town board. Uh, a good example of that is when you, uh, when the village board or the town board is considering a, uh, uh, an amendment to the zoning code. Most of the zoning codes around here will require that the village board or town board refer that proposed amendment to the planning board for its input. And so you've got that direct relationship between the two boards there. Uh, if you have an architectural review board, uh, the, uh, the planning board especially uh, will uh, be sending it out to the architectural review board. Uh, some ARBs uh, are advisory only. Other ARBs actually have approval authority. Uh, and that depends upon the uh, particular jurisdiction. Similarly, with historic preservation or landmarks boards, and environmental commissions. Uh, we, we, we broke out the county planning department um, separately because they have a different status. They are, um, uh, their review is mandated in certain circumstances under state law. Uh, if you have a piece of property uh, under your review as either a zoning board or a planning board, uh, that is either located on or within 500 feet of state or county features, uh, county roads, uh, state or county roads, state or county uh, parks, state or county uh, uh, streams, uh, municipal boundaries, uh, then you must send it over to the county planning department for review under general municipal law section 239 L and M and sometimes N. Um, that re review requirement is jurisdictional. Uh, if, it's if, the if the referral is required and it's not made, that is a fatal defect in the approval if, if that's what it ultimately occurs. Uh, there was a case not too long ago in one of the towns where that did not occur and the court came down and threw out the approval that was granted because it had not gone for GMO uh, review. Uh, the review that's done by the county planning department, um, according to the state statute, uh, is intended, uh, and I'm going to read this to you. It's intended to bring pertinent intercommunity and countywide planning, zoning, uh, site plan, and subdivision considerations to the attention of neighboring municipalities and agencies having jurisdiction. And uh, then there's a list uh, that goes on uh, of uh, the types of uh, intercommunity and countywide considerations uh, that the county planning department 
uh, must go into. And if, if you're interested, you can go and take a look at 239L. Uh, and that is uh, very important. I'm going to get myself in trouble, I think, a little bit with Adam and Helen because we have uh, these, uh, these discussions uh, on paper, at least. Um, uh, the county planning department is not supposed to be uh, an overseer of the local planning department, local planning board or the zoning board of appeals. They are supposed to look at things from the perspective of what are the impacts uh, on countywide, what are the impacts uh, intra-community. Now, very often that's a fuzzy line, um, but uh, it's, it's something that when you get a, uh, a GML review, look at it and say, you know, how is this uh, impacting, uh, you know, uh, the uh, countywide or, or intra-community uh, issues? Uh, sometimes it's not apparent, uh, and sometimes there's a little bit deep, deeper thinking going on over the county planning department than you might otherwise think if you just look at it uh, on a cursory basis. Uh, county planning has the ability to approve, disapprove, conditionally approve, uh, or recommend modifications to a particular project. Uh, approvals are easy. Uh, you say yes, sir, and you go along your way. Uh, all of the others, uh, if your local board disagrees uh, with what the county planning department has said, uh, you can override. Uh, but that override requires a super majority of your board. So if you have a five person board, it requires four affirmative votes. It's not a super majority of those who are in attendance, it is a super majority of the whole. So if a five member board, you need four affirmative votes. If it's a seven member board, you need, uh, you need five affirmative votes. You also need to state your reasons for the override. And they have to be reasons that are more than just we disagree. You have to state explicitly why you're disagreeing with it and what your, what your reasoning is, and that's got to be related to the planning issues that are in front of you. Lastly, you have to report back to the county planning department the reasons why you've overridden and disagreed. Uh, and uh, your failure to do any of that uh, will also adversely affect any approval that you, uh, that you give. Uh, every GML review that's, that comes through has that requirement on it. Um, uh, the, uh, the county planning department is very good about reminding uh, local boards about their, uh, uh, their responsibilities with respect to overrides. Uh, so uh, take those very seriously. Okay, next Adam. Okay, relationship with the professionals. I think that gets turned over to Max. It is, it is. Do we, uh, do we have a poll or did we get rid of that for this session? I think we might have missed it. Do you have the, um, Adam, do you have the uh, yeah, poll? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, there we go. Board member requirements. Let's see if you, let's see if you remember what I talked about uh, 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so in uh, New York State, uh, is a municipal board required to have any of the following? Attorney, engineer, or planner. So make your choices. Adam, we're going to rely on you on this because we can't see what's going on. Okay, yes, we're at 63% uh, participating. So when it slows down, I'll. Uh, I'll end the poll. I mean, this is non-scientific anyway, right? It's just to get, <laughs> it's kind of just to keep everyone involved and have some fun. All right, so it's slowed down a little bit. Let me end it and share the results. Okay. Is a municipal board required to have any of the following? Attorney, engineer, planner. Okay, those of you who said Yes to any of those are incorrect. <laughs> it's a good idea to have all three, but there is nothing in state law that requires uh, any of these boards, uh, uh, any of the land use boards to have an attorney engineer or planner. Uh, village boards and town boards are required to have attorneys. So you must have a village attorney, you must have a town attorney, uh, but not for the land use boards. Okay, okay. thanks Adam. 
No problem. So, so just so we don't uh, trick too many people, we probably should have a, uh, a couple of, of extras that say all or none at the bottom. Yeah, it's more fun this way. That's right. That's right. So as Iris said, uh, board members uh, are volunteers, uh, and it is not um, required that they uh, be related professionals. Um, you know, they are essentially um, uh, at-large members of the communities. They could be teachers, contractors, real estate salespeople, nurses, anybody uh, who lives in the community. And they're typically appointed because they want to volunteer and they want to serve in their communities. Um, they do, uh, uh, they are required to, once they are appointed, to uh, seek out training like this training here um, in order to, uh, to maintain their currency with, with uh, best practices and, and case law and, and ethics and, and so on and so forth. Um, they can be uh, professionals, but they do not need to be. Um, really, you know, a lot of boards will hire professionals, whether it be engineers or attorneys or planners, uh, to assist with uh, applications because applications uh, often can be uh, very complex, um, especially given uh, in New York State, we have what uh, everybody knows to be very complex is the State Environmental Quality Review. Excuse me. <coughs> say Environmental Quality Review Act. And um, you know, those, those regulations uh, can be very complex and they can interact with each other in a way that requires some experience. So it's, it's uh, good to have assistance. Um, attorneys uh, in New York State have to be uh, uh, members of the bar. Um, and professionals, uh, if you're going to employ an engineer in, in the village or, or town, uh, they must be licensed in New York State. Um, generally, they're uh, either selected by the board itself and approved by the governing body, or uh, they are directly hired by the governing body, the town board or the village board. Um, in most cases, uh, the ZBA will choose to employ an attorney uh, to advise the board. Uh, it's much less common that a ZBA would have an engineer or planner sitting with them and assisting them. Um, and that is, is generally because, as Ira went over before, zoning boards uh, are uniquely uh, intended to deal with quasi judicial. Uh, concerns. Uh, they have a very narrow uh, focus or mandate to review their uh, applications based on set criteria um, that usually have to do with uh, a fair, fairly narrow uh, subject matter that don't require assistance by uh, planners or engineers. With planning boards, uh, it is much more common to see engineers sitting with planning boards as well as attorneys. And for planners, uh, oftentimes, um, you know, the, the attorneys will be sitting there for engineer, I'm sorry, the uh, engineers will be sitting there for matters such as, uh, you know, structural issues with retaining walls or grading, stormwater. Um, planners tend to be more widely trained. Uh, they may touch upon zoning and land use practices, lighting, landscaping. Um, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, depending on the community, they may uh, retain other professionals, uh, noise analysts, traffic analysts. Uh, they may have on-call uh, professionals if they're fairly busy, or they may decide to hire them as special uh, consultants as the need arises. Um, oftentimes, they're, they're paid by the, uh, by the town uh, through escrow accounts. Um, the applicant will put money aside for, for the community, and then the community uses that money to pay for uh, the consultants. Uh, the uh, consultants to a uh, community should not be directly paid uh, by the applicant. Uh, generally, uh, oftentimes, the 
professionals will interface with, and this is the, the next slide, Adam, mm -hmm. uh, will interface with the uh, applicants through a technical review board. Um, technical mm -hmm. review board, and there's different names uh, for these around the county. Some are called tech meetings or uh, TAC, tech, Technical Advisory Committee, TAC, or CDRC, uh, Community Design Review Committees. Um, these, uh, you know, however they're called and, and however they're constituted, these are generally intended to provide uh, direct feedback to an applicant uh, for the purpose of improving the application and streamlining the process. Uh, so an application doesn't have to spend a lot of time before uh, the planning board, you know, uh, dealing with technical issues or highly technical issues uh, that may not require um, actual board input, things like stormwater design, um, whether or not, you know, a specific, a very specific zoning provision is met or whether it requires a variance. Those type of matters can often uh, be identified and dealt with in these uh, tech, technical advisory committee um, meetings. Also, it's, it's frequently uh, employed as a pre-application meeting. Uh, so if there is a concept or if somebody has an idea, but they don't know if it's permitted, oftentimes these uh, technical advisory committees will field those types of applications. Uh, so that they can sit down and they can go through the code requirements, other permitting requirements uh, by other agencies. And we'll get into those uh, in a little bit. Um, oftentimes they go through uh, secondary source uh, data. Uh, so before they go out and they, they start uh, doing detailed, uh, whether it be wetland studies or, or flood zone studies, uh, you know, the, the technical review board professionals or, and or the applicants can go and seek out, um, for example, in Rockland County, we have the Rockland County GIS website and the New York State DEC environmental mm -hmm. mapper. And those uh, websites can be uh, queried and, and it can be determined if some of these resources um, and permitting conditions or permitting requirements exist uh, and advise the applicants of, of the presence of those so that they can then uh, account for those resources in their uh, planning uh, thought. Uh, oftentimes, uh, those uh, technical uh, review boards will deal with whether an application is generally consistent with a comp plan. Um, they can go through and advise on process, uh, you know, whether it requires a zoning amendment, whether it might something may require a special permit and who would be the approving board for that special permit. Uh, they may discuss whether waivers are possible. Having been familiar with the code, they may understand that perhaps uh, if, if parking is not met, there might be a, a waiver that can be employed or at least advise them that that's something they would have to go to the zoning board. Um, generally, it's a workshop style meeting, uh, which means it's, it's very informal. Um, as long as uh, there is not a quorum of the board, board members are allowed to attend, uh, but they cannot be a quorum of the board if, if there is a quorum of the board. So um, on a five member board, if three uh, members are present, then that uh, constitutes an actual planning board meeting. It must meet the requirements for advertisement and public access uh, for the, for the uh, regular planning board meetings and advertisement. Um, oftentimes, uh, the, the technical review boards will take informal notes, uh, but they're not required to. It's not, it's not a board. It's not a, a board that has jurisdiction over the application. Again, it's just a workshop advisory type meeting. Um, I think, uh, let's see. Um, next slide, Adam. So here's uh, just a couple of images off of the Rockland GIS uh, website and the New York State DEC Environmental Mapper. And you can see the types of information that are available through these applications and how they can inform uh, early on applications and uh, you know, to, to determine that there might be steep slopes 
What does the topography look like? Are there flood zones, presidents, uh, wetlands, uh, features like uh, sensitive habitat or archeological resources? Um, and these will also help to inform early on uh, the seeker process and, and start to allow the applicant to understand the type of environmental implications that might, might need to be reviewed. So with that, um, I think it's on to Bonnie for record keeping. Good evening, everyone. Adam, I think you have a question for us. Sure. Uh, okay. So here's the question. Our board meets once per month. After a meeting, the planning board secretary prepares draft minutes. We vote on them at our next monthly meeting and we then file them. Is this correct record keeping? Yes or no? Let's get those answers coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We usually do the do, 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 <laughs> do, 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 do. Download that. <laughs> those who remember that show. <laughs> All right, let's see. We're at 70% participation. All right, let's get up to 90. Oh, my. I know some people actually are on uh, phones, so I don't know that they can readily respond. I think it does work, but you know, it might be a little tricky. I don't a know. little tricky, yeah. Whenever you're ready, Adam. All right, well. <laughs> We should have added, I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, that could be uh, what people are, you know, the remaining 26% are trying to tell me. So why don't we just end sure. the poll? Sure. Okay. So. Oh, hi, interesting. So 90% of those who participated said yes. 10% of you, six of 60 said no. People who said no are correct. And we'll go through why. So in New York State, um, there are rules and regulations for record keeping. And you know, a primary objective of record keeping is that decisions uh, are supported by facts and those facts are on the record and that help, helps ensure that the board decision is not deemed arbitrary and capricious. And those are two scary words that attorneys use uh, uh, with regard to some projects, and Ira can describe what that really means when we say deemed arbitrary and capricious. Ultimately, open meetings law requires that the minutes of public meetings must include a record of motions and actions. And that record specifically has to uh, contain the votes of any of the matters, how each member voted, and it must include any absences uh, that occurred. And so I'll unpack that a bit for you. So record keeping specifically applies to public bodies. Um, public bodies include your boards. So the zoning board of appeals, the planning board, legislative bodies, state bodies, other bodies. This applies to New York state. So any public body. And it also includes subcommittees of boards um, that must also uh, uh, provide and, and prepare minutes. It applies to meetings. So it's not just any gathering, but it's a specific meeting. So officially convened meetings to conduct public business. So Article 7 of the Public Officers Law, uh, Open Meetings Law, Section 106, requires that a board take minutes of a meeting if there are any motions or proposals made or votes taken. So it's very specific in terms of what you need to record as far as official filings. Um, importantly, minutes must be in writing. So you can't rely on a tape. Uh, it does have to be written out. Uh, and the answer with regard to the question was, any of those minutes that are required to be filed actually have to be filed within two weeks of a meeting. Um, and if necessary, what you can do is stamp it as a draft until you actually adopt your minutes because it's customary for your boards, oftentimes you only meet every month. And so what ends up happening is you have the meeting, your secretary prepares the minutes, 
um, you receive it during that monthly time period. And then at the next meeting, you actually vote on it. What New York state law requires is actually that when you had taken a vote, that has to be filed within two weeks. So one way to address that is to stamp draft and then at your next meeting, you have your official minutes recorded. Um, generally, the recording secretary will take these minutes, um, notes, uh, they can tape it, they can do transcripts, and it often depends on the extent and the complexity of a project that's in front of the board. So it's customary, you know, to do tape, uh, you know, create the minutes from the tapes if, if they're going to be more elaborate than just uh, recording a vote and or she'll take notes. What's important is, first of all, to find out if your governing body has funded and is providing you a secretary, because in any instance, regardless of whether you have a secretary or not, someone needs to take the minutes. So if for whatever reason, your legislative body has not appropriated funds to be able to have a secretary do that for you, then um, someone from the board will need to take those minutes um, so they can be recorded. Obviously it's preferable to have a secretary. It's very difficult um, to be involved in substantive discussions um, and take minutes. Uh, unless you know a meeting is taped and then you can create the minutes later. But again, in the best of all worlds, you will have a secretary. Um, resolutions with regard to decisions um, are also part of record keeping. Uh, and the municipal recording requirements, and if you look at New York State town law, New York State village law, New York State um, city law, it says in most instances, that a decision has to be filed in the municipal clerk's office within five days of the decision. So if you've written out a decision, if you've prepared a decision with, with conditions, that actually has to be filed within five days um, of the decision. And that decision has to be mailed to the applicant, provided to the applicant. And one of the other requirements that Ira touched upon earlier was if, if you've acted contrary to a county planning uh, board determination, then you need to provide a written finding to them within a certain time frame uh, of that decision. So there are different levels, again, of recording minutes, notes, tapes, transcripts. And there's always a question as to whether, you know, there should be more information or less information in your minutes. And from my perspective, I think that minutes are very useful because, um, especially if ultimately there's a challenge to a decision, your minutes will tell the story of how the board decided upon an action that they did deliberate on it, that it wasn't a quick decision, especially if it was complex. Um, it provides a rationale. And we've had certain cases where a community was challenged by an Article 78 and they were able to rely on the minutes as a way of defending a particular action that um, they had made. Another question is whether or not um, they should be written or if they can just be within the minutes. So sometimes in a more complex uh, situation, a complex project, you may have lots of conditions. Uh, there may be lots of permits that have to be um, obtained from other outside agencies. So in that instance, you may actually want to have a formal written resolution, which can be written up by your attorney, can be written up um, by a planner, it can be done by your secretary at least to start it off, but it'll give sort of all the whereases in terms of all the procedure you followed, and then we'll describe um, the, it will describe the, the vote itself as required, and then it'll have all the conditions of approval upon which they can either file a map or, um, uh, you know, they can, they can have a building permit issued, et cetera. So in more complex situations, it's generally good to have a resolution as far as the record keeping. Uh, but if we're talking about a sign application, something nominal that comes in front of the planning board, oftentimes you can rely on your minutes and, and that vote. Um, it's not gonna be controversial, it's not a big project. Um, so there is a way to integrate. I think we talk about record keeping and this is really more for the municipality, uh, but there are software programs, programs out there that will integrate 
um, all of your, your building department, your planning department together so that when a building inspector, for instance, um, is approached with an application for a building permit that was the subject of, of a site plan or subdivision approval, he can look to the resolutions and the maps that were filed in the planning department and see whether there's anything that still needs to be complied with before he can issue that building permit. So in general, from a municipal perspective, it's very good to have integration uh, of these systems. In general, um, at least in terms of uh, record keeping, uh, and there is a, a link that I have to update for record keeping tips for um, in New York State, but uh, minutes, uh, the hearing record are supposed to actually be preserved forever. Tapes um, have to be preserved for four months after the written record um, is made or after the approval. Um, again, state law itself does not require that you approve the minutes, um, but they are required, the minutes are required to be made available to the public and again, within that uh, two week time period. So um, next slide please. So this slide uh, just shows the image of a checklist and it's a checklist that we prepared for the town of Shongam, which is up in Ulster County. And what it is, is it's a table of the record of all the actions um, and it's a variety of steps uh, and you can fill out the date on which the application was received, when a public hearing was open, when a public hearing was closed, uh, checklists of who uh, an application needs to be referred to, uh, does it have to go to your um, town highway superintendent for a curb cut? Does it have to go off the DEC because there's stormwater um, permits required? So it's a good concise way of documenting and keeping track of um, a project and all that's required, uh, what you're required to go through, the processes and the referrals um, as part of that. So it includes type of application, again, public hearing, the seeker record, um, other approvals and referrals, and substantive information that you might want to be uh, have submitted. And it ultimately helps the town with the creation of these resolutions so that they're as um, comprehensive as possible, again, especially for large projects, uh, because it, it tells the story. And again, ultimately, you want that decision uh, to be rational and to not end up you know, potentially uh, challenged through an Article 78. So next slide, I believe, is IRA. And I think there is a question for this as well. There I am. OK. Uh, I just want to go back. Well, we're not quite there yet, uh, <laughs> Adam. Uh, just just before we get to the uh, to, to, to the to the uh, poll, I just want to emphasize something uh, that uh, that Bonnie said with respect to record keeping and minutes, uh, and uh, that that terrible phrase arbitrary and capricious. <laughs> uh, basically, what it means is that you, you made a decision, you don't have any basis for it, and it doesn't make any sense in the context. That's what the courts are looking at. They are the the courts will not um, uh, step in and substitute their judgment. Uh, for your judgment, if there's a basis for what you're doing uh, that is supported in the record, uh, then more likely than not, assuming there are no procedural errors, more likely than not, the court will uphold your decision. Uh, even if uh, there are two rational uh, decisions that could be made based upon the set of facts, uh, the court uh, will not say, well, this other decision would have been the better way to go. They will defer to the uh, to the land use board, uh, and because of that, all of this record keeping is really, really important. Lawyers talk about building a record. It sometimes drives clients crazy. Why are you doing all of this? We you know we know that this makes sense. We know that this is a good project, uh, and, and I tell the client, the court can only look at what the planning board or the zoning board saw. We can't add anything new if it gets into a court court situation. We're stuck with what we have in front of the planning board or the zoning board. 
and therefore uh, you have to uh, make sure that the record uh, that is in, in front of you as a board is as complete uh, as possible and that your, uh, your records and your minutes and your resolutions reflect all of that information. So uh, it's really, really important uh, from, from, uh, from that perspective as well. Okay, um, let's turn to the poll. Uh, you, you can, I don't have to read it to, to, to you. Um, let's, uh, let's see what, uh, what, what the audience thinks about whether or not uh, the board has to allow people to speak uh, when there's not a public hearing. I thought I uh, ended the poll, but it looks like a lot of people had already started answering. That's okay. We're at 74%, which 75. And I just want to throw in, I, in the chat function, um, I believe in the chat function, I put in the latest link uh, to the record keeping document. Uh, that's actually on the Southern Tier website. Um, New York State likes to every year change its uh, <laughs> it's it's website and the links to them so i didn't catch this one i catched others so i just want to make sure everybody had it if they wanted to look up that document all right i'm gonna end the poll all right all right so if you don't have a public hearing uh scheduled noticed do you need to allow members of the public to speak the answer is no you do not uh, members of the public have the right to speak at a public hearing, uh, and a public hearing is specifically noticed as a public hearing. There are uh, legal notices placed in the newspapers. Uh, there are posters that are uh, placed on the property in many of our communities. Uh, there are letters that are mailed to people who live within a certain radius of the project. Uh, and uh, there are the the, that, those are the public hearings at which members of the public must be allowed to speak. Uh, if you're just having a regular old public meeting and you're not having a public public hearing, uh, then you do not have to allow the public to speak. You can, um, and sometimes it makes sense to allow the public to speak even when it's not a public hearing, but there is absolutely no requirement uh, to do so. So. Let's turn to relationship with applicant and then judging by our time, we should probably take some questions and answers uh, after we're done with this particular segment. All right. So the open meetings law uh, is uh, what we uh, were discussing. Uh, and that is uh, where you get the distinction between a public hearing and a public meeting. A public meeting is basically any time uh, occurs, anytime you have a quorum uh, of a board, in other words, a majority of the whole number of the board uh, that is meeting for the purpose of conducting business. Uh, if you have a five member planning board and three of you happen to meet at the supermarket, that's not a meeting. Okay, that's that's just serendipity. Uh, same thing at a, a holiday party, uh, for example, that's not a public meeting. The idea is if you have a majority of the board that is meeting for the purpose of conducting the board's business, uh, that is that is a meeting for purposes of the open meetings law. Uh, the idea is to uh, promote transparency in government. We don't like backroom deals. Uh, we don't like it if uh, an applicant goes or, or an opponent goes, for example, uh, uh, and somehow or other uh, can secretly influence uh, the outcome of a board's decision. Uh, and so everything that is done is supposed to be done out in public uh, with notice to the public uh, so that everybody can see what's going on. Um, in addition, uh, you want to make sure that your board members are impartial uh, and they make a decision based on the facts of, of the record. Uh, if you are a board member and you have some sort of interest in the application, uh, you need to seriously consider whether you should be participating in it. And that, of course, depends upon the level of your, your interest in the application. Uh, if you happen to live in the same neighborhood, you're probably okay. You can probably participate, uh, especially in our smaller villages. It's almost impossible uh, to find a situation where one or more board members 
is not within the neighborhood that the application uh, takes place. Uh, on the other hand, if it's your next door neighbor and you've been fighting with that next door neighbor for the past 30 years, uh, you probably shouldn't participate. Uh, although, oddly enough, I don't think state law would require uh, that you step down. Uh, if you're an owner of the property, okay, then you may not participate. Then you've got an irreconcilable conflict of interest. Uh, if you have a question about that, uh, you should be speaking with your board attorney. Uh, the board attorney may refer you to your, uh, uh, your, your local board of ethics. Uh, is that, that the next slide, Adam? We, am I getting ahead of myself here? Yeah, there we are. Okay. Uh, so uh, ethics and conflicts uh, for municipal board members uh, are, are governed by what we call the general municipal law. Uh, of the state of New York, and that applies to every municipality, villages, uh, towns, cities, fire districts, uh, road improvement districts, every municipality in the state of New York. Uh, and if you've been a board member for a while, you may have seen what we refer to as an 809 affidavit. Uh, and that refers to section 809 of the general municipal law, uh, which, which requires an applicant to disclose uh, whether or not any officer or employee of the municipality uh, has an interest in the application. Uh, now that's really important to know um, because it's not just that, you know, whether, whether or not the applicant uh, uh, it is uh, related to, for example, a town board member, okay? If the applicant is related to a custodian too in that town, that needs to be disclosed. It goes down that far. And it has to be every uh, uh, applicant. Uh, if uh, you have a uh, uh, joint owners of a piece of, of a piece of property that's before you, both of those people uh, must make their uh, their affiliations, if any, known to the board and ultimately to the public. Uh, when it comes to things such as corporations or limited liability companies, a lot of our communities have come up with additions to the 809 requirement and have required that the LLCs or the corporations disclose uh, their memberships and have, uh, require that their members uh, fill out 809 affidavits. The 809 affidavit also requires uh, that if you own more than 5% or more of the stock in a corporation, that you disclose that interest. And again, uh, that you disclose whether or not uh, you have uh, any uh, uh, relationship uh, to any officer or employee of the municipality. Uh, along with that, I mentioned before, board of, uh, your local board of ethics, every community um, must adopt a code of ethics and you must have a board of ethics uh, that will provide uh, you with guidance. Um, don't take that lightly. If you think that you're in a situation where you may have a conflict, you know, go to your board attorney, go to your board of ethics, get an answer, get yourself covered. Uh, one of the uh, local uh, attorneys around here who, does, who works for a lot of municipalities uh, once get a, gave a discussion about this and he talked about uh, uh, what he said, what he called the newspaper test. He said, you know, if you're in a situation where you're, you're, you're not sure whether or not you should go ahead, think to yourself, do you want to read about it in the newspaper the next day? That's, that's similar to uh, 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 another test called the pillow test. Okay, are you gonna be able to sleep tonight based upon the decision that you made? Trust your gut. Okay, next. Okay, I think this is a good time uh, to stop for, uh, for questions and uh, then we'll go over to, uh, to Max uh, for, relation, um, for relationship with other agencies. Adam, do you want me to ask the questions? Um, I've got them pulled up here. I'm going to start with the uh, earliest ones. Uh, can a member of a planning board advise an applicant independent of the other board members? I'll take that one. Okay. <laughs> that kind of goes back to what we were just talking about in terms of open meetings. Uh, it depends upon the circumstance uh, in which that occurs. Uh, we talked about um, 
uh, committees such as TAC and CDRC or Orangetown has what they call PRC. Uh, if a planning board member is a member of that committee and is meeting with the applicant in that context, uh, then yes, absolutely, because those meetings are all open. Uh, but on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis, it's not a good idea for individual members of the uh, of a board uh, to be communicating with an applicant. Uh, those uh, all those communications really should go through official channels. Okay. I'm gonna mark that one as done. Uh, next question: Can I get a copy of the slides? Uh, I, I'm happy to distribute that unless you think this is something proprietary. Not at all. Okay. We actually do. Um, and oftentimes people will ask for the slides and, and they can be sent around digitally. Okay. And we actually normally have handouts if we were in person. So That's it's all true. Good. <laughs> um, yeah. Go ahead and send me an email and uh, I, you know, for, and I'll be happy to send that out to anyone later. Adam, I, I think last uh, last year we actually also provided the recording of, of this uh, webinar. Yes, my, my intention is to post the re recording online. Um, this is my first time behind the scenes running the Zoom session. So if I've done everything correctly, and that's an if, uh, yes, we will post the session online. Um, but I'll also, uh, if anyone requests the slides, I'd be happy to email those out. All right, uh, next question. What, de what determines what projects require a site plan or a special permit and not just the approval of the building inspector? Well, that, that, would, that would be in your zoning code. Um, and uh, different communities have different standards. Most of the, well, excuse me, many of the communities around here uh, will require site plan approval uh, for anything other than a one family house. Uh, some of the communities, especially along the river, uh, Upper Nyack, Nyack, um, Piermont, uh, uh, will re Grandview uh, require site plan approval even for single family houses. So it really uh, depends upon the zoning code. Uh is it a violation of the open meetings law for two members to convene for the purpose of discussing, discussing the application? Um, unless it's a three member board, no. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, you're, you're welcome, Michael Car Phillips, Philip Carmichael. I said thank you. And if an applicant requests an informal meeting with the planning board, is this considered a public meeting? Yeah. Bonnie, you want to handle that? As long as there's a quorum, it is a formal meeting. Well, Sometimes we use the word formal and workshop and I think that can get confusing. Um, some communities will say, in fact, my, my own community, our planning board will have a workshop meeting and then we have uh, what they call a formal meeting and the workshop is where we listen to applications, but no decisions are really being made at that point. And then we like to have all of our applications where there's a decision or an action to be taken to be on a different agenda uh, that month. But the reality is they're both pub they're both planning board meetings, they're both public meetings, they have a quorum and they're official meetings. Well, I mean, I think uh, perhaps the questioner is asking, could someone come to the full body, uh, the full planning board, maybe not necessarily a, a TAC committee uh, with an idea, but have, not having made a formal application? It's, it's a public meeting. So it would have to be, so if it's a quorum, oftentimes the TAC, the technical advisory committee meetings, the morning meetings, they'll actually be set up with the consultants and by design, they may have less than a quorum of planning board members, representatives there. But then ultimately the application typically ends up on an agenda where you do have the full board meeting. 
But even if it's informal, even if they want to appear before the planning board, um, as soon as you have a quorum, it, it's a public meeting and it has to meet the applicable New York state laws. And, and one, one caveat to that, and Ira, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, when a quorum meets to discuss board business, because a Christmas party is not a board meeting. Right, <laughs> right. But this is within the this is right. within the context of an informal meeting, assuming right. to discuss a uh, an application. Right. And some of these TAC and CDRC committees uh, are in fact uh, agencies that are covered by the Open Meetings Law. Now, if they've been established by a local law or resolution, and they're not just you know an ad hoc type of thing, right. uh, then then they they too are subject to the Open Meetings Law, even though it may not have a majority of the planning board members or the zoning board members there, um, if a majority of the TAC members are there or the CDRC members are there, then it becomes a, uh, a meeting that is subject to the open meetings hall. And that's where that, um, when you went, when we were going through record keeping and it talked about subcommittees, um, as you said, Ira, if it's officially constituted, then, and it's a subcommittee, then it would also have to provide a certain level of record keeping Right. noticing, et cetera. Right. All right, next question. Would you advise ZBA members to speak directly with building department slash code enforcers or just rely on submitted paperwork? One of you guys wanna handle that? <laughs> That's a that's an IRA question, I think. <laughs> well, it's 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 kind of both actually. Um, you know, as, as you know, we've been talking about the open meetings law and the fact that you need to keep things transparent. Uh, but the question wasn't, uh, as I heard it at any rate, was do you really do you, do you need the building department to come to your meeting? Uh, and uh, make a statement or a presentation? Or can you rely upon the written? Uh, memos, and uh, from that in that context, uh, from that perspective, it really kind of depends upon the complexity of the issue. Uh, if it's something that's relatively straightforward, uh, you can probably rely upon your building inspector's memo, it's just assuming that it's, it's clear. Uh, if it's something more complex, you may want the building inspector to show up at the meeting and to explain him or herself, or to be able to answer questions. Would it be better if not just uh, for a variance application, but perhaps an appeal of the building inspector's decision? Perhaps in that case, there would be added benefit to having the inspector there? Uh, certainly. Uh, you know, uh, especially if it's a close question. Uh, the building inspector may, may have nuances uh, that are not necessarily uh, adequately explained in, uh, in a memo. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of people have difficulty uh, uh, expressing themselves on the written page <laughs> and are better able to do that, you know, speaking with the board. Uh, and so that, that certainly is, is helpful, but uh, that becomes a matter for the, for the individual building inspector. I, I guess, I, and it, you know, it's kind of where we get this single sentence question and, and it depends on the circumstances. So let's say it's um, a situation where something's been referred to the building inspector um, as a code enforcement officer and he's made an interpretation and then someone challenges it. And so now this a particular interpretation is in front of the ZBA. Um, they say, would you advise ZBA members? I don't know if that's collectively the ZBA or just any ZBA member, you know, would it be appropriate in that kind of a circumstance? Well, under that circumstance, again, you have the transparency requirements of the open meetings law. Uh, that's that in a certain circumstance like that, that would, you know, somebody is appealing from the determination of the building inspector. Um, ZBAs are quasi-judicial agencies. And so not, not to elevate it uh, to a point of ridiculousness, but uh, would you want a judge uh, to speak privately with one of the parties? Okay. The answer, of course, is no, of course not. Uh, so that's a similar type of, uh, that's an analogy. Mm -hmm. All 
right. Moving on. Uh, oh, can you please give me your email address to request the slides? Well, I will type it out. I believe every, I'm hoping everyone can see it. I'll put it up at the end of the session too. I don't know if everyone just saw that, but I typed my email. Perhaps it just went to the person who asked the question. I don't know, but uh, I'll put my email into the tech, into the chat uh, as we get to the end of the session as well. So you'll have another chance at it. All right. Uh, can or should a board meet with its attorney or advisor in executive session for discussion? No vote taken before a meeting. I, I guess that one is mine. <laughs> um, uh, the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, boards are entitled to legal representation. Uh, discussion, uh, you know, the, the board is the attorney's client in that, in that situation. Uh, and as with any attorney-client relationship, uh, communications can be privileged and can be secret. Uh, and so, yes, it's entirely uh, uh, permissible for a board to uh, go into executive session for attorney-client discussions. Now, uh, when you go into executive session, you have to start out in, a, in an open session, in a regular session, you have to take a vote uh, to go into executive session, and you have to specify why you're going into executive session. You can't just say, oh, we're going into executive session. Uh, so in this case, you would, uh, the motion would be to go into executive session for the purposes of consultation with counsel. Um, and uh, once, once, you, uh, once you're done, then you come back out and you make a motion to come out of executive session and go back into regular session. Uh, and there are other circumstances where you can go into executive session too. Uh, and frankly, <laughs> the other circumstances uh, kind of escape me right now. Um, but, but they are limited and they are set forth in the open meeting as well. Okay. Uh, I see another person asking to email or supply a copy of the checklist that you spoke about earlier. Um, again, just uh, send me an email requesting that and I'll be happy to send that out uh, sometime in the next couple of business days. Okay. Uh, are zoning boards allowed to adjourn meetings? If yes, are there certain criteria to do so? And I can take that one again. The answer is yes, they can. <laughs> uh, when, when we use it, technically an adjournment is, is, is closing, but I, I, we, we tend to use it when we mean a continuation. Uh, and I'm assuming that this would be in the context of a public hearing uh, with respect to continuing the public hearing to another date. And, and zoning boards, of course, are just like any other board, a planning boards, ARBs, uh, historic review boards uh, are always allowed to continue public hearings to a later date. Uh, if there's a need, to, uh, if they feel that there is a need uh, to gather more information, or if, for example, it's a controversial matter and you can't get to everybody who wants to speak on a particular evening. The rules with respect to continuation uh, uh, are, first of all, that it has to be done by a majority vote of the, uh, the board. Uh, and again, when we speak about majority vote, we mean a majority of the whole, not just a majority of the people who happen to be in attendance that evening. Uh, if the public hearing is continued or adjourned uh, to a date certain, then you do not have to send out new notices. Sometimes a board will say, we want to send new notices out anyway, because the thing has been adjourned uh, a number of times. And uh, people may and members of the public uh, may have lost track of what's going on. Uh, it may be that there has been uh, a delay that the board thinks is uh, rather long. And again, they, the, the fear uh, that the public uh, may, uh, may have lost track. Uh, but in general, if it's adjourned to a date certain or continued to a date certain, you do not have to send new notices out. If it's continued or adjourned uh, without a date certain, Okay, an open-ended thing, uh, then new notices must be sent in the same manner as originally uh, for the adjourned or continued date. All right, uh, 
couple of people saying thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, one person's asking, I serve in the US EPA Board of Scientific Counselors. Is there any conflict? I'll give uh, I'll give Ira a break and say no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll agree with you. Okay. 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 Um, well, for, at the moment, oh, here's another one. Oh, <laughs> by the way, my claim to fame is firing all of the academics by President Trump. All right. <laughs> I have a somewhat of a celebrity here. Um, okay. Oh, we have a question. Can a person serve both on planning and zoning boards? No. No. Not at the same time. All right. And that doesn't mean on different days. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll have an, we'll have another question and answer session at the end. So. All right. So uh, am I up? Next? I think you are, Max. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, planning boards and zoning boards, particularly planning boards, uh, may relate to other agencies. Um, and and if you haven't already experienced this, you you quickly will that uh, most development um, applications of any considerable size will require involvement by other uh, permitting agencies. Uh, we often deal with this, um, you know, in, in the course of planning board business at the federal level uh, with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, they're involved typically when federal wetlands are involved. Um, oftentimes, you will hear uh, that there is a general nationwide permit um, involvement with, with Army Corps. That typically means that Army Corps has established that certain applications are of a nature that as long as they conform with certain requirements, they, they don't need an individual separate permit review. Um, that, uh, you know, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is, is a unique one in that they are uh, typically very busy um, and have limited resources. So um, it's one that requires care, especially if this is a larger application going to through a seeker process. Um, typically, what will happen is if you suspect that federal wetlands exist on the site, um, and that could be from, uh, as we discussed previously, the GIS resources that we discussed, the environmental mapper or the uh, US or, or the Rockland County GIS mapper. Um, or you may notice uh, areas of the site that are wet or, or have vegetation that is consistent with swampland. Um, in those instances, you'll want to seek a, a jurisdictional determination um, the Army Corps typically has 30 days to respond, and if you don't uh, get it back in 30 days, um, you know, there, there's an assumption that it, it's not under the jurisdiction, but um, sometimes it's just they're too busy to respond. Um, so, so that's a, a bit of a unique one. Uh, New York State DEC uh, is another agency uh, at the state level that is often involved. They also regulate wetlands and typically wetlands over 12 and a half acres qualify to be state wetlands. Uh, DEC will also be involved in uh, areas that disturb uh, over uh, one acre. And oftentimes those are required to submit what are known as storm water pollution prevention plans, which are sometimes uh, identified as SWIPs uh, for short. And those uh, plans deal with uh, stormwater management, typically, as well as erosion control. Uh, DEC will also get involved with stream permits. Uh, if there is a regulated stream on the property, uh, they will get involved with uh, sensitive species habitat. If there are uh, 
threatened, endangered, um, or rare species that are known to exist near the site or in the vicinity of the site. Uh, they may require either a restriction, for example, on tree clearing, or they may require certain habitat studies to be submitted. Uh, and in the event that there will actually be an impact on species, they may actually require what's known as a takings permit. Uh, there are several other uh, state agencies that often are involved, DOT, anything uh, that requires an access out onto a state highway uh, will typically require a permit from DOT. Um, anything that requires a state or federal permit will usually uh, involve the Office of Parks, Recreation, and historic preservation um, for a, a separate, uh, what's known as a section 106 uh, review. Uh, and that will essentially establish that there aren't impacts on uh, historic resources. Regardless of that, that is often something that uh, localities uh, may have to deal with when they're going through the seeker process. So. If you receive a, a seeker EAF that indicates there might be historic or archaeological resources in the vicinity of a project, uh, the Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation will do a consultation upon request, a seeker consultation, advising on whether there may be impacts to historic resources. Um, and that usually will require uh, the local government requiring the applicant uh, to submit their project through what's known as the Cultural Resources Investigation System. It's an online platform where you input the, uh, the project information and it's uh, the way that you essentially communicate with uh, that office, also known as uh, SHPO uh, or, or abbreviated as SHPO, which stands for State Historic Preservation Office. Um, Let's see, so also county agencies. Uh, you know, most, uh, in many communities, uh, most applications will fall within 500 feet of a um, uh, municipal boundary, whether it be village or town boundary, a um, county stream, a county highway, a state highway. Um, there's a number of other uh, triggering um, criteria uh, for GML review. Uh, and GML review, as Ira explained previously, requires that the application uh, be sent along to county planning uh, so that county planning can advise on issues of inter-municipal or countywide uh, concern. Another uh, unique uh, approval to Rockland County is any application First subdivision must be signed by uh, the commissioner of the Rockland County Drainage Agency uh, before being allowed to be filed in the office of the county clerk. Uh, so any uh, subdivision application, regardless of its location, needs to be referred to, to the drainage agency. Uh, but generally, that agency also has a jurisdiction for any activity within 100 feet of a county regulated stream. Uh, a permit would, would typically be required. Any county roads uh, access onto the county road uh, will require a road opening permit by the highway department. And the health department is involved in uh, several uh, types of approvals in the county. Um, the Rockland County Department of Health is actually um, given jurisdiction by the New York State Department of Health uh, over reviewing water and sewer uh, connections. Uh, uh, not so much uh, lateral connections, but I think uh, main extensions. Um, septics, uh, new wells, water supply wells, what are called public water supply wells, which may be owned privately, but intended to serve the public. Um, that would still be a public water supply well. Um, also, uh, one area, anything that um, contains a swimming pool uh, that is not private to a um, single family residence uh, that is, is available to the public um, or you know, by membership, for example, 
as part of a homeowner association, also requires county review, mobile homes. Uh, there, there is a whole list of, of actions that would require uh, county health approval. Um, in addition to those, we also have other local agencies, oftentimes a project that is before the planning board uh, for a site plan approval may also require a special permit. And uh, I don't know if we have any uh, communities in Rockland County that still re might require a special permit by the zoning board. Um, that was common at one time, it's less common now. Uh, but certainly uh, many communities still require special permit approval by uh, either the town board or village board, depending on, on whether the planning board is a, is a town or a village planning board. Um, additionally, as we know, there might be variances required that involve uh, the ZBA or an interpretation on appeal of a determination of, of the building inspector may require clarification. Um, sometimes zoning amendments are part of a sequence of actions uh, or landing of a floating zone uh, or, or a more complicated uh, land use approval by uh, the local um, governing board. So that raises a question is, is when do you send and coordinate with all of these other agencies? And there are actually different requirements for when um, these should be, but, but generally it's when uh, the application uh, constitutes a complete um, accounting of the project. Uh, that would seem to be counterintuitive because at the same time you want to get uh, oftentimes these agencies in early in the application phase. Um, Generally, uh, you know, the, the first step of seeker, which is sort of a separate conversation, uh, will require on any complex project uh, that could have environmental impacts that it be coordinated uh, with these agencies. So oftentimes a community will send out what's known as a lead agency, lead agency notice of intent, um, alerting other agencies that you've received an application and, and you will be reviewing it and you want to be lead agency under seeker. Uh, and, and conduct the environmental review. That's, that's usually a first uh, opportunity to uh, contact these other agencies um, early on. Um, oftentimes DEC will do a full permit check when, you receive, when they receive a request for uh, lead agency um, determination uh, and they will tell you what their permitting authority is. Uh, also, uh, it, it should be known, however, that if that application proceeds through your planning board process or, or even your zoning board process and changes in any um, substantive way so that the previous referral is no longer a complete accounting of the project, that needs to be re-referred um, in most cases. You know, certainly for, for the GML review, um, but in, in some cases for the other uh, permitting authority reviews. Um, so I, I think that is generally it uh, for involvement of other agencies. Next slide, Adam. So I'm going to go through site visits uh, and why we conduct site visits. Uh, and I always like to show this picture, and I have others, but in particular, this picture uh, is a Conoco Minolta site. Um, with social media nowadays, there's plenty of information available that many people like to take a look on Google Maps, Google Earth, um, and other uh, applications to gather information about a site. And ultimately, that's not in the best of all worlds, what you would rely on. You would actually go out to the site itself. Um, when I did a Google search of this particular property, it's in Glen Cove, um, city of Glen Cove out on Long Island, uh, we were preparing a report uh, with regard to a big infrastructure project um, and a grant. So they had to report back to the New York State Department of State about this grant. So I went out there fully, fully expecting to see the image on the left, which is what I could see in Google. And in fact, I saw the image on the right. And so this entire 
facility had been demolished. And in fact, it was the subject of revitalization, redevelopment. There was a lot going on. And if I was just simply writing a report uh, back to Department of State, generally talking about land use, not having gone out into the, the field, it would have been incorrect because obviously going out there and seeing with your own eyes, um, it was a different circumstance. So it's really important to conduct site visits um, to determine what's on the ground. Um, you know, your board members should do this and professionals should do this. We had a situation not too long ago where a professional for um, an applicant in front of one of my planning boards uh, had not visited the site. And we were discussing the fact that the applicant was in violation because he was already conducting activities on the site, storing equipment, doing other things. And she had, he had no idea that that was going on. Actually, two of the professionals didn't. And it was kind of um, shocking to us that that was the case. And certainly we always want to appear knowledgeable and we want our boards, whether you're representing the board or representing an applicant, um, for those boards to have a level of confidence in you. So again, to get a sense of what's in the field um, is often very important um, to the whole process. Next slide, please. So uh, site visits provide context um, of a proposed action. It's a discovery period. You're gathering information. And so it's not just the paperwork. It's not just looking at you know, going to DEC and, and seeing what they show as a wetland or as a stream. The resources that you look at often that are online are secondary resources. They're done from imagery that's taken from aerial photographs that are taken from high aloft. And so you can't see all the details of what might be there. You can't see all the wetlands that might be there. And so it's best to go out onto the site and, and especially you know, for your, uh, as well for your consultants to go out to the site. So with that, um, I think we have a question, Adam, in this regard. Um, all right, there's a couple of questions. Um, uh, very uncomfortable when before an applicant and you have, rep oh, this is- oh, Sorry, I meant our question. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> our poll question. Poll, poll. <laughs> poll question. question. All right. Sorry about that. My bad. So, okay. I jumped the gun with the Q and A. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. All right. If you are a board member, does your board conduct site visits together as a board? Yes or no? At 58 percent. All right. Got a few more people there. Sixty-five. All right. Few more trickling in. Okay. All right. Why don't we end the poll now? It's been about a minute. Okay. So uh, the majority of the boards do not go out uh, to conduct a site visit. 65% and 35% of you that responded do go out to the site. So, you know, let's discuss why this is important. Um, there's just information that, and, and, and you can only get a sense of a property and what the, the effects of a development may be if you're out at the property itself. Um, even if it means going around the periphery of it, um, just looking at it, getting a sense of where the neighborhood is. 
maybe not even having to walk the site depending on the size, but there's nothing like, again, getting out into the field. Um, there's so many benefits, including um, community character issues. Uh, you know, oftentimes the site plan ultimately, because it's a wetland scientist, it will show you wetland. It will show you what's on the site itself. But what you don't necessarily get out of um, the site plans that are submitted to you or the subdivision plans are what's going on around the site. What happens at <clears throat> a new intersection that's proposed and that's going to generate traffic? Is there a house directly across from it? Uh, what if this particular use might generate a certain level of noise at particular uh, time periods? Is there a residential neighborhood next to it? So um, how much vegetation is really on the site? Oftentimes when we look at Google, it looks like there's a nice green mantle um, that exists and an applicant might tell you, well, we're preserving 25 feet of buffer and uh, that should be adequate to buffer the adjoining residential neighborhood. Well. When you actually go out there, you find they're all deciduous trees, they're relatively mature, there's no understory, and 25 feet doesn't provide very much of anything as far as buffering. So um, again, a project may be impactful to a neighborhood, so you would get a sense of that from going out uh, into the field. One of the things we always like to see uh, on site plan applications, subdivision applications, is a little checkbox and have the owner sign um, consent for you to walk the property as part of a land use application. They may want to walk it with you. Uh, they may want you to give advance notice, but you, know, you should really try and get them early on to consent to you visiting the site. Um, if it's a particularly large project site, you can have applicants actually stake out certain features that you see on a site plan. Uh, sometimes if you're on a larger property, if it's wooded, um, it's difficult to determine where you are relative to what you're seeing as far as a proposal. So you can ask them to, for instance, stake out the center line of a road, the center point of where a house is proposed. Um, you'll be able to see better where the improvements are relative to the lay of the land and the features on it. Um, you can ask them and very common to do a balloon test, for example. So whenever you have telecommunications facilities, cell towers, um, often you do a balloon test. So where is this gonna be visible from? And then you drive around, you check out the site, drive around the seat, site to see where it could be visible from and what you might need to do if you can um, to mitigate the visibility of certain features. Uh, when you look at maps, sometimes it'll say steep slope, 35% slope. And until you actually get out onto the site, you don't know really what that steepness looks like. Um, where you see a road and it's along a 35% slope, you might see that to actually accommodate a flat road, you're going to have to do a lot of cut and fill, a lot of land disturbance, um, where if they just slightly adjusted the road to the left or to the right, you could avoid, um, much of that disturbance. You might move some houses if it's a subdivision around to a different layout, again, to avoid future. So these are the things you can see from actually uh, walking the site. It's very useful if you can to conduct these site visits with your professionals uh, because you as volunteers, when you're walking the site, you may not recognize a wetland, a wetland seat, but your professionals may say, look, you know, based on the vegetation I see here and the hydrology, it appears that there is a wetland here and they haven't shown it, or there might be a drainage issue that your engineer will point out that needs to be addressed as part of the stormwater facilities plan. So we were in the middle of a site visit out in a rural town of mine. And as we walked it, we found a family burial plot and it wasn't shown on the map. So it's something that had to be addressed and preserved. It's just you find things in the field that you would be surprised that that you just aren't going to pick up on, on a site plan or a subdivision plan. Um, site visits are not required to be open to the public. So you don't have to have you know, people present as part of your site visit. Um, it is, I believe, subject to the um, open meetings law. So if you have a quorum, uh, you may have to notice it. And Ira can speak better to this as far as the requirements. I'm sure you will. 
Um, do not discuss the application with the um, other members um, or the applicant. You're not supposed to be deliberating outside the purview of a meeting, you know, for transparency purposes. Uh, but you do want to disclose any facts that you've discovered at the next meeting that you hold. Um, and there you might want to, at that point, deliberate on what you saw. But really, the purpose of going out into the site is a fact finding. Uh, it's part of fact finding mission. Next slide. So there are tools that can be used. Um, and, and nowadays, engineers, the applicants, representatives, their designers, um, or your in-house professionals can provide you with information before you go out into the field to orient you to what is happening. So in this instance, um, we created an aerial. Uh, this is in the town of Tuxedo. Uh, this is a site where at one point they were contemplating uh, putting housing. Uh, so we uh, provided the limits of disturbance on an aerial. Uh, and we, we did that on an aerial that had off leaf conditions. So you kind of can see the ground area. And we were able to bring it out into the field so that we could see within that area of disturbance how it related to the site, what was there. You know, we found bedrock, uh, found a stream. Um, we were able to capture that and make notes about it as we walked the site. And so, you know, if we were trying to get to a particular point, we could weigh fine based on where we were relative to uh, the parking lot or the building, you know, that was on the same site. So it's very useful. Um, to have tools to assist you when you're out there walking the site. Uh, again, you know, once you've gathered this information at that point in time, uh, you will describe what you observed at the regular meeting. Um, again, to let people in the audience know, people of the public who are interested, uh, and to inform board members who may not have been present. Um, in fact, you know, sometimes an applicant will not be entirely aware of, of what's there uh, or their designers. So it's just a good process. Again, after you do the site visit, go to your meeting and then discuss what you observed. So with that, I think Ira's next. And Ira, you might wanna touch upon again the, um, for site visits, the requirements for notice, what you're allowed to discuss, what you're not, et cetera. Sure. Um... The uh, site visit is actually an exception to the open meetings law. Uh, so you really don't have to give notice uh, to the public ahead of a site visit. I think it's a better practice if you do. Um, it, it, it just avoids uh, questions. Uh, a neighbor, for example, may see uh, board members gathering uh, at a site for a visit and wonder what the heck is going on. Whereas uh, if you've given notice ahead of time, uh, that neighbor will know, um, might come out, might watch you doing your site visit. Uh, the uh, property owner can exclude uh, members of the public. Uh, I will tell you that as an applicant's attorney, whenever I have a site visit, I will always advise that the uh, public be excluded from the site visit for insurance purposes. Uh, board members are covered by the municipal insurance co uh, coverage. Uh, but if you've got this, a vacant site uh, with a little bit of grade uh, and maybe some uh, fallen branches, uh, you know, I, I don't want my, uh, my applicant clients to uh, be potentially liable if uh, some member of the public trips and uh, hurts him or herself. Um, so the boards can go uh, en masse uh, uh, as a board. Uh, for a site visit, uh, it is not uh, violative of the open meetings law. It is a uh, an exception to the open meetings law. So hopefully that uh, that covers that. Um, right. But, I was just going to say, Ira. So and and open meetings law says for anything other to, I guess some of the cases for anything other than to observe and acquire information. That's when right. it doesn't that constitute. Is so again, that's why you have to avoid the deliberations, et cetera, because then you're, you're doing something different than the exception allows. Right. There really should not be any conversation between the board and the applicant uh, other than to gather information. Uh, there should not be conversation among the board members 
uh, other than for clarification points, uh, certainly not deliberative uh, conversations or substantive conversations. Why don't we go through public hearings? And uh, we did discuss a lot about public hearings and uh, uh, a little bit earlier, and then we'll have a little time for uh, for questions, uh, well, for uh, discussing help that's available and for questions. Uh, for board members, uh, don't worry yourselves too much with noticing for public hearings. The clerks will usually take care of that. Your board attorneys will, uh, will assist the clerks uh, different communities have different standards with respect to the notice requirements, um, and those may be dependent upon the location of the, uh, the project, the size of the project, the type of the project, uh, but your clerks will take care of that. Uh, public hearings are required for subdivisions, special use permits, and variances. They are optional for site plan. Uh, most of the communities around here will have public hearings for site plan, uh, at least for preliminary. I know the town of Clarkstown only has public hearings for preliminary uh, site plan, but not for final. Uh, a lot of other communities have uh, public hearings for both preliminary and final site plan. Um, the, uh, the, the public hearing is part of the information gathering that the board has to go through. Uh, prior to issuing its determination. Uh, and uh, while if you've been to a number of public hearings, you may very, very well hear the same sort of things coming up over and over again. You may think, well, you know, uh, they're, they're just trying, trying to fit their opposition into a particular uh, 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 set of categories, or they're just trying to fit their support into a particular set of categories. Uh, it's not that unusual to find out something new at a public hearing. Uh, people who live in their community know their community. They know uh, they know how the, how the drainage works. They know where the snow gathers. Uh, they, they, they tend to have uh, more detailed information uh, sometimes than the uh, design professionals uh, or your consultants. So, so you know, don't give those public hearings short shrift. Uh, they are important. Uh, they are required. Uh, and they're, so they're important for no other reason than that. Uh, but you do sometimes uh, uh, get information that you might not otherwise get. Uh, I'm not sure why uh, 239 NN is here under public hearings, but uh, GML 239 NN is a requirement that notice be given to an adjoining uh, municipality or actually a municipality uh, that's within 500 feet uh, of any project. And that's a special notice that needs to be given to that municipality uh, of the application itself, not just of the, uh, the public hearing. So uh, in the interest of time, we'll go on to the next slide, which I think is help available. Uh, and I'll start off on that. Uh, your, your help, the help that you should be uh, looking for in the first instance are the consultants uh, that uh, that your community pays for, uh, your town or village engineer, town or village attorney. Uh, if your town is lucky enough to have an on site uh, an onboard planning consultant or traffic engineer, uh, consult with them. Do not be afraid uh, to ask to hire specialists if that is the if if that is needed. Uh, sometimes things get a little tricky and uh, the, the generalists may not have the information that you need. Uh, and so that sort of help is certainly available. Uh, Bonnie? So, um, again, with regard to resources, there were some resources embedded within uh, the actual uh, presentation, the slides. So we'll make sure those are all up to date. These are up to date. Um, always go to your local county planning department. They're a wonderful resource for information and all the webinars that they uh, produce through the Planning Federation are, are very useful. Um, there are many online training courses that you can get from New York State Department of State. Again, the link is provided there. Uh, zoning school case law, that's particularly useful if you want to understand concepts in zoning. If you want to understand cluster development or what a special use is uh, versus a permitted use, uh, you know, it gets into many zoning concepts for planning boards and, and ZBAs alike. Um, New York Municipal Planning Federation, they haven't uh, in 
a couple of years, but they do have annual meetings that planning boards attend. Uh, they have mock planning board meetings and uh, a lot of good topics on planning in general related to a municipality and, and, and planning trends. And then of course we have the secret regulations which are always part of um, the process. So I will provide the checklist. Um, there was reference to the ethics checklist, which um, that's Patricia Salkin's work. Uh, I have a, a copy of that, I believe, so I can provide that as well. Um, real quick, 239NN, uh, that's the notice of the hearing um, that has to go to the municipalities within 500 feet of the municipal, municipal border. Uh, well, a project that's within 500 feet. And I'm just trying to, I'm doing the sweep. <laughs> I'm trying to think of some of the things we may or may not have. Um, well, while you're thinking covered. about that, let me just get back to CEPRA. Uh, the regulations can sometimes be difficult for lay people to understand. Uh, DEC has some wonderful uh, other materials. Uh, they have the, uh, the, the CEPRA workbook, mm -hmm. uh, which is downloadable. Uh, you can certainly download that uh, rather than having to go out to the website. And that is uh, laid out. Uh, along the same lines as the regulations, and it's it's a wonderful resource. I I, I, I dip into it frequently. Uh, in addition, uh, they have um, uh, they have work uh, they have workbooks and explanatory information with respect to the environmental assessment forms. There's a there's a set for the long form and a set for the short form, uh, and they go question by question. You know what is meant by this? What is meant by that? What are we looking for? Uh, and uh, I will tell you that I have frequently turned to that uh, when having, uh, shall we say, a disagreement uh, with the local community about what the EAF response should be, or when I have to bolster something. Uh, it's it's the, the EAF workbooks and the, uh, the secret workbooks uh, are the best guidance that we have. Uh, they are written pretty much in, in, in lay English. Um, most people with a passing familiarity with land use and, uh, concepts will understand them. Yeah, I, I would add to that too, Ira. Um, in, in going to the Department of State's uh, uh, training, local government training, there's a particular document called the Guide to Planning and Zoning Laws of New right. York State. Uh, that is a really helpful uh, compilation of uh, New York State Village Law, New York State Town Law, um, uh, General City Law, and General Municipal Law. And it really goes over the elements of each of those laws that is particularly um, applicable to planning boards and zoning boards and, and village boards or town boards that are approving land use applications. So. Uh, I, I would put that up there with the seeker handbook and the EAF workbooks that you were uh, describing. I, I would add to that, especially for the subdivision regulations, because oftentimes some municipal subdivision regulations and procedures are older and there were changes made to the subdivision regulations and they really apply. Um, so the subdivision Same thing with the zoning board, Bon. Yeah. Yeah. So the area variances and the use yeah. variance, sometimes the, the code doesn't have those. Uh, your local code won't have it, but that that is what applies. So that enabling legislation is in that that guidebook, which is again a useful compilation. Should we uh, get to some Q and A? We uh, we're, we're almost nine o'clock, but I'm I'm willing to stay a little longer and, and deal with questions and, and answers. Okay. Uh, most first question was uh, very uncomfortable when before an applicant and you have reply letters from several of these agencies, yet the applicant doesn't have them. Why does this happen? A lot. <laughs> so, you know, I can only say that if the circulation is being done by the municipality, if the referrals are being done, uh, those referrals and the responses from the agencies are going to go to the municipality. And then it's incumbent upon the municipality to provide it to the applicant. What I will find in, in my experience is often the applicant has already consulted almost as part of a due diligence process agencies um, and they'll fill out an EAF where they'll provide information that says they're not having impacts 
um, or they don't need a permit, et cetera. And it's because they have actually gone out and sought uh, opinions and letters from those agencies. And you want to make sure that you receive them so that you have a full record uh, of what uh, they have received as well and, and what they're relying upon as far as um, what they're representing to you. Uh, and there was a follow-up question from the same person who is responsible to get them. So. Uh, if it, it can be done, but I mean, ultimately, let's say a, a project needs a permit, the applicant has to gather information necessary to support, to support a permit application. Um, but during the CEPA process, as I had said, if you're circulating for lead agency, meaning you're going to be in charge of the CEPA review process among all the other involved agencies, often it's the municipality that gathers the information. So um, it, it depends. I, I, you, you guys still do a session on Seeker too, correct, uh, Adam? Um, I don't think it's something we do every year. Um, but okay. we we'll probably do for another one soon. So yeah, we'll yeah, that that's, in mind. that's really something. I mean, we we talk about, and you'll hear about coordinated review and uncoordinated review. Um, you know, I, I, there are certain applications, smaller applications, that are allowed to go through uncoordinated review. Um, but if if you want to get comment from permitting agencies early. Um, you know, it does really make sense to do a coordinated review, which is optional for, for unlisted actions, because it gives those, it, it sort of alerts those agencies to the project and allows those agencies to provide comment when it's still at an early phase and, and adaptable. There's no applicant that wants to get, you know, six, eight months down the road before a planning board and discover that you know whatever they've worked out is never going to get approved by DEC or DOT or or some other agency. So getting them involved early in an advisory capacity through Seeker is is if it's you know even if it's not required for an unlisted action, it's it's still an advisable um, uh, an advisable process for most uh, applications. Uh, next question, do we need the, the permission of the homeowner to visit the site? Uh, yes, you do. Uh, otherwise, you're, if, if you don't get that permission, you're, you're a trespasser. Um, that's the legal answer. The practical answer is, yeah, uh, you know, think, think about, put yourself in the homeowner's position. Uh, would you want a bunch of people that you don't know traipsing around your yard? Uh, there are places, um, you know, in the more rural areas uh, where that can actually be quite dangerous uh, to show up unannounced. Uh, so yes, absolutely get the permission of the homeowner, let the homeowner know in advance when you're gonna be there, whether you're gonna be there as a board or individually. Some, some boards actually have it as part of their application process. Yes. As soon as you fill out your application, there's a, a, a consent to enter the premise, uh, the, the, the site, the lot, not the premises, the, right. the lot. Um, and that puts them early. And just, just realize also that that consent should be by, you know, whoever is occupying the lot. Property well, owner. Right, right. Because sometimes you're dealing with contract vendees um, mm -hmm. and the person that owns the lot or maybe residing in the house maybe somebody different than the person you're seeing at your at your meetings. Or ultimately the property owner itself, the contract vendee may be in front of you, but you want to make sure the property owner consents to it. Right. But by the way, just, just picking up on that, um, and this really hasn't been touched on, uh, it is entirely uh, proper for a contract vendee, somebody who's in, in, in contract to purchase a property to make an application before a board for relief. However, uh, if it is a contract vendee, then you must also have the consent of the owner of the property to the application. If the, if the property owner has not consented to the application in writing and around here, all of the application forms have that. 
But if the owner of the property has not consented, then again, you have a fatal uh, defect in the jurisdiction of the board. And even if you manage to go ahead through the whole process and grant an approval, that approval is no good. Uh, next question, can, can you define limits of disturbance? So um, the limits of disturbance are, is the area on a property within which um, there'll be changes to the land, they'll be disturbing, demolishing, grading, uh, any kind of activities that um, propose to alter the landscape. And so typically you want a site plan to show the limits of disturbance because there are certain permits uh, that can get triggered, um, including the creation or the preparation of a stormwater pollution prevention plan, which gets triggered uh, one acre and more. So the planning board should know what the limits of disturbance are. Also make sure the limits of disturbance are realistic. Um, oftentimes to avoid having to put in stormwater controls or soil erosion uh, measures, you'll see a site plan that's been designed and it shows very tight limits of disturbance. And you know where that development is proposed, you may know that all the homes in the neighborhood all have lawns, have landscaping, they've clear cut areas around their homes, you know, forested land. So it has to be realistic to, you know, in, in terms of the amount of disturbance you can expect to make sure that, again, there are adequate measures put in place with things like great drainage. So it should always be shown on a plan. All right. Uh, can a planning board member visit a site alone? <coughs> yeah, yes, we, uh, I think we already discussed that, yes. Uh, again, you, again, with you, permission and notice. And you can, but sometimes, you want to give someone notice that you're on the site just for security reasons. Okay. Uh, what happens when an eagle's nest is within an area where a building is to be demoed and a new building to be built in the immediate area of the nest? That, that, that's, go ahead, Max. No, typically that, that will trigger uh, a permit required from DEC. It's, it's called a, a incidental takings permit. So at a minimum, there should be consultation with the New York State DEC to see whether or not the activity is one to um, generate the need for an incidental take permit. It, de it depends on what kind of buildings being demolished, how close it is to the, the bald eagle's nest, um, how much is being disturbed. But the best thing to do is consult the New York State DEC with regard to it. I could just share one quick anecdote. Uh, when I worked for a municipality in Connecticut, uh, uh, there was a nest found just in the middle of the ground of a construction site. Um, it was a type mm -hmm. of bird that kind of laid its eggs amongst river rocks. It was near the shore. And mm -hmm. they shut down the entire construction site for a good month because- Piping clover? Uh, that might have been, might have been. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm not a wildlife expert, but it was some endangered species and there was a mm -hmm. nest that they, this bird built a nest in the middle of a construction site and everything stopped for a little while. Yes. Sharing that. Um, can a board accept new information during the public portion of a scheduled hearing? Yes, that's, that's the whole purpose of, of the public hearing is to accept new information. Uh, the board can accept new information from the applicant, from members of the public, from its consultants, from uh, uh, other consultants, that's that's the point of the public hearing. Can you please elaborate on lead agency vis-a-vis -vis the planning board? Uh, not, not in less than 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, so Seeker requires that for, for anything that is uh, type one action and significant size action that all the agencies involved in, in approving that action uh, coordinate the review and that one of the agencies be designated lead agency. 
And the lead agency is the one who does the actual environmental investigation, meaning they make sure that the information in the EAF is correct. Uh, they go through the part two EAF um, and they, uh, which asks questions about whether impacts are likely. And then they ultimately make the determination of significance, which is a determination that counterintuitively, if it's a positive declaration, um, that's not good for uh, the developer because they will be spending money on an environmental impact statement, which is a more in-depth environmental review, and a negative declaration, which is more typical, which means that the planning board considering the project and, and reasonable uh, project uh, elements designed to mitigate impacts won't significantly impact the environment. So, you know, the lead agency is only involved in, in coordinated review. Uh, outside of coordinated review, every agency for an unlisted action can do a separate seeker, um, meaning they can decide that um, individually, you know, zoning board before they approve uh, maybe uh, some type of uh, interpretation or variance for parking, for example, uh, that there won't be an impact. And then the planning board, when they do the site plan, would have to figure out there's going to be no impact. And then when it goes to uh, DOT for a curb cut permit, you know, whatever those permits are, they each individually do uncoordinated reviews. But even for unlisted actions, smaller actions, um, an agency can enter into a coordinated review process. In that case, they would initiate that by sending out the advertisement of the project to all involved agencies saying we're going to do coordinated review and we want to be the lead agency responsible. And that's called a lead agency notice of intent or NOI. So I got 43 minutes, Max. <laughs> Okay, well, there's, I could probably go on for another 42, so well, I think we'll we're stop cool. there. All right. Uh, who is responsible for an incomplete application? The applicant, the secretary or clerk, the attorney, and who and should boards entertain in incomplete applications? Well, ultimately, it's the applicant uh, because it's the applicant that's putting in the application. Sometimes things happen and things slip through. Uh, whether or not the board should entertain an incomplete application really depends upon what's missing. Uh, if it's something that's easily filled in and you're not at the end of the process and it could be filled in and you know, at the next meeting, there's probably no harm uh, with respect to entertaining uh, a, a quote unquote incomplete application. Uh, you know, an address of some sort, for example, uh, something that's, that's not jurisdictional. Uh, if, on the other hand, you don't have an owner's consent, okay, the board should not move forward. Uh, certainly, if you don't have maps or drawings, you shouldn't move forward because you've got nothing to work with. Um, if there's, uh, uh, and, and, and you need to understand that the, the, the materials uh, that one may consider uh, as, as part of an application uh, evolve as the process moves along. The application is not simply that form that is filled out at the very beginning. Uh, it's that form, it's the drawings, it's the consultants reports, the traffic studies, the wetlands uh, reviews, uh, the, uh, the legal uh, arguments. Uh, it, it's all of the above, uh, not only from the applicant, but also from the, uh, from the community and from the other agencies. So the truth is, is that you really don't have completeness until you're absolutely done uh, and you close your public hearing. I would, I would follow on just shortly and briefly that um, there's a, there are, are communities where I've worked where, where the process is broken and you just get sloppy applications that make it to the board. And that's not what I'm referring to here. Uh, but almost in every instance, there's a certain degree of reasonableness that goes along with the submission requirements for a site plan. Um, and there's going to be an application for a very basic, you know, change of use um, that doesn't require every single item on the site plan checklist. 
Uh, and usually in most codes, there, there is some uh, latitude or authority vested with the planning board to waive submission requirements in appropriate circumstances. So, um, and sometimes those may change. So there may be a very basic application that the board may decide doesn't need a topo survey, a topography survey. Um, but as the application goes on, some question arises and they change their mind. So um, sometimes it's not as, as straightforward as whose fault is it? Sometimes it's, it's something that um, is about making reasonable judgments and then maybe making reasonable adaptations as the project advances. And then I would just add that sometimes some of our boards actually at the end of hearing a particular application will say that the application is still incomplete because once it is complete, certain things can get triggered. There are timeframes, there are hearings, there are um, you know, a, approvals that have to be done within certain, again, timeframes um, that get triggered when you say the application is complete. And sometimes you might be saying that application is complete enough, uh, but when it's definitely not complete, it's useful at the end of when you're hearing uh, that application to say application is incomplete, and then they should get a list of what is needed to um, get to a point of completeness. Uh, next question, can a board establish a policy of refusing to hear applicants with outstanding violations until those violations are taken care of to the satisfaction of the municipality? Oh, that's Ira. This, this is this is one of my uh, frankly one of my pet peeves uh, because there are communities that try to take that position, and my argument is that a violation doesn't actually exist until a court tells you that it exists. Uh, when uh, the building inspector or the code enforcement officer issues a notice of violation or a summons, he is simply making an allegation. Uh, he is saying, I, I believe that there is a violation, but that violation may or may not exist. Uh, you know, we, we live in a country, fortunately, where you are innocent until proven guilty. Uh, and so simply because a violation notice has been issued does not mean that a violation actually exists. Uh, now, what I would also say is that very often uh, an applicant is aware that there is a problem. Uh, that needs to be corrected. And the only way to correct that problem is to go to the planning board and go to the ZBA and get relief. Uh, I had a, uh, a situation uh, a number of years ago in one of the communities where a purchaser, uh, uh, a, 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 an applicant bought a piece of property knowing that there were violations on the property or knowing that there were outstanding violation notices on the property. Um, but he was willing to remedy those violations and remedy the situations. But the only way that he could do so was by getting approval for, uh, for what he wanted to do from the planning board. So to have a blanket policy like that uh, is, is frankly, uh, A, uh, I think violate, violative of, of the, uh, the US Constitution and B, very often can be counterproductive. Um, I'll just actually ask one question myself. Um, for in terms of public hearings, what are the guidelines for imposing time limits on public speakers? Uh, the uh, the board can impose reasonable time limits on public speakers. Uh, the board need not uh, be held hostage, uh, you know, to 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 hours and hours and hours of uh, of public hearing uh, time or days and days and days. Uh, if they give a reasonable amount of time, usually three to five minutes, uh, with an opportunity to provide written comments, uh, I think that that's, uh, that's sustainable. Okay. Uh, and the last question, if I have more questions, I think of later, what's the best way to get them answered? Uh, Adam, can we use you as a clearinghouse? <laughs> well, you can definitely ask me. I'm not sure I'll get the best answer, but I'll try. Well, no, no, if, if, if the, if the if the question goes into you and then you, you farm it out to which one of us you think is best. All right. Uh, let's set a time limit of 48 hours. 
Uh, so you're not on permanent retainer to uh, the planning department. How about that? Sounds good. Okay. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions and we are a little bit over time. So I'm just going to go back now to put my email address uh, on the screen for anybody. And uh, yep, one more question came in. Let's see what this is real quick. <laughs> you guys are awesome. I agree. You guys are definitely awesome. Yeah. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for participating tonight. And I especially want to thank our presenters, Ira, Bonnie, and Max. Obviously, this session could not happen without you. And I am very grateful for your time and effort. I hope everyone found this session to be informative and that you gained a better insight into your role as a board member. Again, if you want to contact me, my email is there. Uh, if you have questions or want copies of the slides, or if you are outside of Rockland County and want a certificate of attendance, uh, just shoot me an email. Uh, my hope is that I'll be able to post links to the recording of this session soon. And before we go, I just wanna remind everyone of some upcoming training sessions through the Federation. On Thursday, April 7th, we have clean energy in your comprehensive plan uh, with speakers from NYSERDA. Wednesday, April 13th, an overview of affordable housing by uh, speakers from the New York Department of State. And Tuesday, April 26th, an overview of the model solar law, which is also being done through NYSERDA. In addition, please keep an eye out for emails regarding other training sessions, including sessions two and three of the certification series. And that's all for me, uh, unless- uh, I, I just like to, to say one thing, Adam, because I see all these thank yous coming in on the chat. And I wanna thank everybody here who volunteers their time uh, to serve on these boards. It's often a thankless job. <laughs> A, a job that that you know generates a lot of criticism and, and angst and it, it, you really thank you for for serving and, and it's our pleasure to help and assist this program right agreed agreed we enjoy it and thank you for participating well said all right well that's all so uh i'll end the session in a moment good night everyone have okay. a good evening Good night, Good night all. Stay safe. Drive home safely. <laughs> <laughs>